Well, <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Uh, my name's Tim Bailey. I'm the Director of Education for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Zuckerberg in the back of the room. She's with our uh, finance and our, uh, how we get the monies to be able to do programs like this, which we'll talk about as part of, the, uh, as part of this presentation. Um, I hope that everybody read in the description of, uh, of what we're going to be doing today that we're not only going to be looking at what Hamilton is. Well, actually, let me just go, let me just jump past it. Oh, by the way, that picture there, that's a, uh, one of our, our student groups um, that we work with. And we're going to be talking about how did this happen? How did Hamilton happen? Um, what are we doing with it? And what do we plan on doing next? Um, so, oops, wrong button, sorry. OK, there we go. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do introductions, both of myself, and we're going to see who we have out here. Um, and then uh, an overview of Edgeham. Um, Edgeham is the hashtag for the program that Lin-Manuel Miranda created. And when Lin-Manuel creates something, you just leave it alone. And so, um, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, how the, the name of the program evolved. Some Q&A uh, that you may have about the program and uh, any questions you may have. Uh, and then um, creating your own performance piece. I want to take you through the process that we have students uh, go through. And so I hope that hopefully you're feeling some high energy, even though it's the afternoon. I know. Uh, I asked them for a morning session. They said, <laughs> whatever. You can take what you get. I was like, OK, fine. Um, but this will, this, will get you, this, will, this will get you going. And then for those of you very brave souls, a little performance piece for your peers. So. Um, so we'll, uh, now, uh, look, you, you laugh, but I had, uh, I, I did this presentation, or some, uh, one very similar to it, at South by Southwest a couple weeks ago. And uh, I asked in my, the group that I had there, uh, how many of you uh, have, you know, teach or have anything to do with civics, history education, government? Out of about 50 people, two. And I said, OK, great. This is going to be a great experience for us. So we got to this part. We got to the end. I said, OK, volunteer. Who wants to share what you've, what you've done? This woman stands up. She says, ah, I'll do it. So I hand her the microphone. She belted off the most amazing rap piece. It brought down the house. And I said, what do you do <laughs> you know, in your regular job? I'm a computer systems analyst for my school district. <laughs> and a closet rap star. <laughs> so, so yeah, she was amazing. So, I, so if you have unveiled talents, or even if you don't, um, that's, where we're, that's where we're heading. OK, so here are our objectives. To introduce the Gilda Lehrman Institute of American History and how the organization is changing, how history is taught and learned across this country, to provide an overview of the innovative Hamilton Education Program, and then experience, like I just said, experience how the Hamilton Education Program is a revolution in teaching American history. Um, OK, me. So uh, I am the director of education for the Gilder Lehrman Institute. I've been with the institute for about five years. Uh, well, I take that back a little bit. Um, I've been in New York for five years working with the institute. I've actually worked with the institute for a couple years before that. Um, in 2009, I was lucky enough to be named as the National History Teacher of the Year, which is one of Gilder Lehrman's programs. Uh, we sponsor the National History Teacher of the Year program. And that's when I got introduced to the Institute. Uh, they asked me to do some work for them, so I did it remotely. Um, I'm, there I am, I'm standing in my classroom in Salt Lake City. I taught fourth and fifth grade, and then I taught eighth grade US history. Um, and at that time, they uh, asked me um, in 2011, I believe it was, they asked me if I would take the job of the director of education. The director was retiring, and would I uh, consider the job? And I said no, uh, because my son was a senior in high school. And so I said, you know, I just, I just can't move from Salt Lake City to New York City in his senior year. Um, sorry to pass. They called me back, and they said, let's, let, OK, let's talk about this. How about? You still take the job, but you just commute for a year. <laughs> so hang on. So I'm going to be, you want me to commute from Salt Lake City to New York City for a year? Yeah. OK. So, 
So when anybody had anything to complain about their commute, I had nothing to say to them. <laughs> um, so, uh, so then, so my wife and I moved to New York, Salt Lake City, New York City, same thing, right? Um, and, uh, and, we've, and we've been there uh, since. So, um, so that's a little bit about where my journey so far. Um, the Gilda Lehrman Institute of American History. How many of you have ever heard of the Gilda Lehrman Institute? There's a rare fish. <laughs> so, no, it's, um, so we've been around for 25 years. I mean, it's not like we're you know, brand new. However, if, you, if you're not in our world, I can see why you, you may not have heard of us before. And if you're, how many of you are from, are from the uh, East Coast? Located in the East Coast, okay. Um, we were much more thought of as an East Coast organization just because we're based in New York. Um, and a lot of when we started, that's a lot of who we were dealing with was the East Coast. But we are very much a national organization. Um, we're dedicated to improving K-12 history education. That's our mission. Um, we are engaged with, um, all, it's now it's almost 22,000 affiliate schools across the country, and internationally, actually. Um, and those are schools that we, um, offer free materials and programming for uh, throughout the, the year. Every month we reach out to our affiliate schools and offer teachers uh, materials, programs um, that they can access for free. Uh, we are a nonprofit, we live on the largesse of others, um, and uh, we are able to offer teachers um, materials in order to teach history and civics uh, in an authentic primary source based way. Um, for instance, just this last, um, this last month, we offered four um, posters of African-American women in, uh, in American history. And uh, they st we started with um, Phyllis Wheatley uh, in, the uh, in the Revolution, Sojourner Truth, um, all up to uh, Rosa Parks. And those four posters, full-size posters, beautiful posters, went out to about 6,000 schools. Um, and so that's pretty good reach um, uh, by the Institute, and we do that every month. Um, and uh, we have, the Institute is built on a collection of 70,000 primary source documents. And so it, at the time that the collection was donated to the Institute by uh, 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 Richard Gilder and Louis Lehrman, our founders, uh, when they donated it to the Institute, it was the largest privately held collection of American history in the world. Um, and they donated it to the Institute with, for this purpose of K-12 education. Look, they looked at the, their collection and said, look, we've collected this amazing, amazing collection. At that time, it was about over 60,000 documents that range from, we have Columbus's letter from Ferdinand and Isabella from 1493 that's pretty much the beginning of American history um, through um, you know, much more current with a very, very robust collection of um, founding era and uh, antebellum and uh, up through reconstruction. That's, that's really the core of the collection, although it does span. Uh, and we're building right now, very actively building our 20th century collection. Um, so um, that, but that core of our collection um, our founders said, you know, what are we going to do with this collection? Um, what's the purpose of this? I mean, they did it because they love American history and they'd been collecting it. And fortunately, both of them very successful entrepreneurs who were, were able to use their leverage to build this collection. But do we donate it to our alma mater? Do we give it to the National Archives? Do we, I mean, what do we do with this? And they said, well, we want to inspire the next generation and generations to love American history like we love American history. Well, how do you do that? Who do you do that through? They're teachers, right? So they created the Institute um, to build, to reach teachers in order to be able to uh, complete this mission of uh, creating a love for uh, American history and uh, the knowledge of our, uh, of our country and its ideology. That was, that was the purpose of it. Um, we collaborate with a network of not only eminent historians, but the most eminent historians uh, in the United States. Um, one of the programs that we have, we, we offer a master's degree in partnership with Pace University in history. And look, you could go to any great university that has a great history program. You, know, you go to Columbia, a great history program, but you still only get Columbia's professors. 
our master's degree program is based on, we cherry pick the best historians in the country where they are. And so each semester, our students get this, uh, this offering of all stars on topics across American history that then they can uh, take. And we only charge, okay, I gotta tell you, this was a mud wrestling contest with Pace University to get the tuition that we got. But for a three credit course, it's $750, okay? Needless to say, it's pretty popular. <laughs> um, and so it's been, and you know, for Pace, the argument was, well, we can't you know, charge $750, that's crazy. You know, nobody's, that's, that's, that's and I, we said volume. If we can give you volume, you know, can you do it? Well, okay, but you know, we want to be able to back out of this when you guys can't uh, hit that number. Yeah, okay. We're, uh, it, it's going great guns. Our first graduating class is gonna cross the stage uh, Radio City Music Hall uh, this May. So, um, so a, a wild success. Um, many, many other programs that if you, uh, if you want more information, you can certainly uh, go to our website, uh, just gildalarma.org, um, or talk to uh, Susan or I after, and we'll be happy to fill you in on many other things we have going on um, that include, uh, and as K-12, we provide resources for elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, and so, and, and we have programs with postgraduate as well. Um, it, is, it is truly a, an all-encompassing, um, if you ask people that are in the know, they will tell you, and, that, and which will get us to Hamilton, uh, why were we picked to do this the education program in Hamilton? Has a lot to do with what I'm talking about. Um, so what is the Hamilton education program? So I'm gonna show you uh, a, a video that will take you through basically what this program is, and then we're gonna talk about the nuts and bolts and how it came about. I think we're in a time when history is more important than ever. History is all around us every day. The Gilder Lehrman Institute has the mission of promoting the knowledge and the understanding of American history in the K-12 population and more broadly. One of the principal purposes was uh, to use it to teach American history by teaching the documents themselves. Tonight. Hamilton is the most exciting thing that's happened in American theater and American history in a generation. Through the Hamilton Education Program, over the next five years, we expect to have 250,000 inner city kids from Title I schools have a chance to experience the founding era through our curriculum that sets them up to do their own original acts and then experience the show Hamilton. The show's producers have been working with the New York Public Schools, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the Gilder Lehrman Institute, to make sure that thousands of low-income students have a chance to see the show. I think initially they were probably scared, um, already bored. I think it's challenging to get them to sit down and read anything, let alone try to explain to them why they should read the Bill of Rights. I was really just surprised at how excited they became about learning history. That's why my capitalism was a big No, no. When the people were that. Like, yeah, 1800s. That's what I'm saying. That's why, that's why Great Britain was a mother country, because they had the necessary obviously, factors. Obviously. Seeing the primary sources different, you read what they wrote, what they said. I chose the event of the Boston Massacre, and then we had to find the primary sources. Like, it pushed me to do some stuff to learn about history. So how has Hamilton maybe opened up your eyes? Hamilton could really relate to some of us today because many of us, we may not know our father and we may not know our mother. And it's like, the use of these primary sources really shows how back then people really like struggled just like the way we struggle today. So in terms of our English language learners, a lot of them still feel like they're not there. Um, I think after this curriculum, a lot of them were more invested. Taking the from what they said. I pretty much ain't know that much information about it. All I pretty much knew was that Jefferson grew up rich. I knew like some things, but it wasn't like very really clear to me until like on this project. Personally, I didn't really care, but this 
event helped me want to learn more and more. So then we started talking about most of the Ten Amendments, and then it just led us to making our, our rap. What's his last name? Was? Last name Jefferson, first name Thomas, broke these Ten Amendments, they were sort of like a promise. We don't have time to go over all of them, so what we gonna do is talk about a few. So listen to us. song. One of the main ideas behind our rap was how about we pick a couple of rights that are being maybe like a little yeah, abused or like misunderstood. Not a lot of people understand the full potential of the Bill of Rights. I like the practice, but I'll be nervous when I'm in front of everybody else, but I, I should be good. UA School for Emergency Management. Yep, yep. Please put love for Delvis, Naomi, and Deja. Hey. I'm explaining something to y'all. Understand that these were written for us. So I don't plan on stopping at all. Until you understand these rights, then it's right. My favorite part about the project is pretty much everything we can like it's just like <laughs> we were all friends already but i think this made us even closer so yeah. it was fun they do feel a little bit of a civic sense now because they know things they didn't know before after they do the research and they create a product that they're proud of they sort of realize like oh i will remember this project forever <laughs> It's making the arts at the highest level available to kids who may never have felt themselves included. It became clear to me that what I study in high school actually means something as I go out into the world. I think it'll steer the students into the direction of becoming activists. I love seeing students who typically do not get engaged in class assignments become really excited to perform. I think they'll be able to look back on this as a moment where they developed a greater appreciation for what this country is, how it was created, and what it could be. this happen? <laughs> um, so let me tell you what the basic, let me talk about the overview of the program first, then I'll tell you the etymology. Um, so the target is a quarter of a million students uh, at Title I, uh, in Title I high schools across the country over five years. Um, that five-year goal uh, is the end of 2020. Um, so it's right around the corner, and we're, and I'll show you the numbers where we are currently, but we are certainly on track. Um, the program um, cost is about $25 million um, to do this. Uh, the initial funding came from the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and Rockefeller, it was funny, the, um, just I'll jump ahead a little bit in that how we got this. So, so Jeffrey Seller um, had, uh, an education program when he produced rent. And so he saw that it was you know, a, a very important part, he felt, of the process um, was, uh, was this outreach to, to students on critical topics. Um, and Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, some of you may know, so he was a seventh grade English teacher before he went did the whole Broadway thing. So he also was a, a huge uh, proponent of, of education. And they, they all saw that this, and believed that this needed to get in front of students. How? 
How, how is that gonna happen? And they didn't know how to teach history or what the, what, how to do outreach to uh, students and so on. So they asked Ron Chernow because um, you know, Ron wrote the book and he actually was working, uh, worked with Lynn uh, as Lynn was writing the musical. Um, they would argue, uh, they would discuss uh, uh, you know, uh, what you should have, what you shouldn't have, what's you know, artistic license, what's no, that never happened and we can't say that kind of thing. Um, and they asked Ron, what should, who should, well, Ron had been, had worked with the Guild of Learning Institute over the years, like I said, we have a bevy of the best historians in the country, Ron being one of them. And Ron had worked with the Institute doing programming with us over the years, and Ron said, there's one place you need to go. There's one place for history education that you, I, I will hook you up with. So, my executive director at the time came to me and said, um, I just got a call from Ron Chernow, who has this, musical that they made his book from that they, they wanted to see if the, we, we would work on an education program. I said, okay, what is it? And they said, well, it's, it's a musical based on the life of Alexander Hamilton. So wait a minute, the first secretary of the treasury, a musical, <laughs> seriously? Oh yeah, 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 it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's at the public theater. And, uh, and you know, do you think we can do something with it? And I said, well, I've got to see it before I could know if I can do something with it. So I said, okay, well, we'll get you Ron Chernow's seats. He's got uh, seats at the public and go see it. I said, okay. So I went, sat down, eighth row center at the public theater, little theater off Broadway. Two and a half hours later, I got up, walked out and said, yes, <laughs> I think we can do something with this. Um, I, I was stunned, amazed, floored. I mean, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. And so, but what? What could we do with it? What are you gonna do with this? Um, incredible opportunity. So I, um, we had Ron and his, uh, Ron Chernow and Jeffrey Seller come to our office. They sat down. Um, I had fortunately, just a few weeks before that, written a, uh, a lesson plan called Vietnam in Verse where I took music from the Vietnam era, um, both anti-war and patriotic, um, and had to tell the story of what was going on in the, um, in the Vietnam uh, war on the home front, and used uh, music to do that with. And then I took poetry <coughs> written by soldiers that were in country to explain what was going on with the soldiers. So using those as primary source documents to students, but through the arts. And so I'm, uh, the best way to learn something is to? Do it, sing it. Do it, exactly. And so what I did was I made, I made uh, Jeffrey Seller um, do a lesson with me on Eve of Destruction. So we, when we finished, I said, that's how you can use you know, history and music. And, and he said, okay, you're hired. I'll go find the money. And two weeks later, he called and said, okay, I've got, uh, I've got 1.2 million from the Rockefeller Foundation. We're, we're going. You've got three months to pull it off. And so we did. So this partnership between the producers of Hamilton and the, and the Miranda family started. Um, it's a curriculum grounded in historical documents and serves as the basis for those original student performances like you saw in the video. The curriculum fosters an, uh, a personal learning experience, encouraging students to recreate lessons of the founding era, but in their own way. And it provides an innovative framework that can be replicated. That's the other part of this. This is not a one-off. Um, teachers that have used this program then take these same strategies and techniques that they learned in doing the program to apply it to other parts of their curriculum. And so in that way, it's replicable. So this is not just a one-off. Um, and we've had uh, focus groups with students, I mean, with, and well, students and teachers, and the teachers say that that's one of the benefits that they see of it, is that they can then apply these uh, strategies to their uh, other parts of their curriculum. So this is, these are the program components. The in-school um, curriculum and, and student work, then the student performance and matinee, and then program evaluation. Oh, by the way, I love in that video, um, how often have you seen uh, students in the hallway arguing about um, the Stamp Act, <laughs> okay? That just doesn't happen, right? Um, and, you, and yet you see that. 
Um, it, that is, that is, was not an isolated incident. All of a sudden, students are having conversations about um, things that you would never expect uh, from them. And then finally, program evaluation. How do we show that this is effective, that it works, that um, it can be, uh, that it can be replicated and uh, not only replicated but expanded? Um, so let's start with the in-school curriculum and the student work. Okay, so the curriculum engages high school students. Now, the, the, the reason it was aimed at high school students was because um, a couple of reasons. One is there's some language in the show and some themes in the show um, that, uh, that the producers and, our, and ourselves thought was appropriate for a high school audience. Um, and the other thing was that Rockefeller Foundation was very much interested in um, raising the level of awareness of, of uh, high school students. So that's why it's, it's aimed at that. Um, and, um, and it treats the, the, uh, the students as historians, and you'll see why when we go through the curriculum, how it works, um, writers and performers. It's, a, it's designed as a three to five day curriculum. Now. That's to do the in-class work. I have to be honest with you, um, most every school that we work with then take uh, the amount of time they spend on it is gonna be more than that because as the students work on their performance pieces and so on, that's a lot of that's done outside of class or done in cooperation with um, other departments. So the theater department, the music department, the English department get involved with helping the students craft these performances, rehearse these performances, polish them. Um, so it's, it very much spreads beyond the history classroom um, in schools. Um, student, there's a student and a teacher guide. So the, um, every student gets a booklet um, that has all of the, the entire, uh, all of the coursework that they're gonna be doing with this uh, is provided to them. The teachers all get an online uh, downloadable um, lesson, basically lesson plan that walks them through the steps of how to pull this off in your class. And there's also, we designed a differentiated uh, activities for students that are um, second language learners or if they read significantly below grade level um, that teachers can then uh, use as alternative activities, but they accomplish the same goals. Um, so that they get at that, that same, so it's not like we're denying the students um, using that differentiated curriculum anything, it's just that they're having tasks that are uh, more suitable for their, uh, their uh, level. Um, the students learn how to analyze complex text, and I'm gonna show you how we do that in just a second, but that is a critical part of this. When I designed this program, there were three things that I had in mind. Um, one was that students would learn what was absolutely crucial for every American of, the, uh, of what makes us who we are and what our potential is and who we can be as American citizens. Two, that they would learn critical skills when it comes to analysis and writing. When it comes to reading complex documents, when it comes to writing argumentative pieces that are substantive, that they can back up with textual evidence and that they can support uh, both in writing and orally. And third, that they would have a mind-blowing experience they would never forget. Um, and I'm pretty happy to say that I think we hit all three um, uh, through this program. Um, and finally, creating a digital portal that's used by students to conduct the research. So we've designed, we built a portal from scratch where the students that is robust in what you can do with it. Um, one thing that we have, look, every American history teacher in the country that's worth their salt is using Hamilton in their classroom. If you're teaching American history in the founding era, you better be using Hamilton um, because if you're not, it, that's criminal because your kids uh, know it even if you don't. Um, but what they don't have is the access we have because of our relationship with the production. Um, and with, with Lin-Manuel. And so we have interviews, we have um, video from the show, we have um, uh, both, uh, I mean we have, so for instance, David Diggs, who uh, played um, Lafayette and Jefferson in the, in the uh, original cast, we have him sitting in our collection with a document, an original document of Jefferson's in front of him that he's touching and looking at talking about what it's like to be a black man playing a slave owner. 
that's powerful. So that kind of access, that kind of resources, we provide the students and the teachers that they can tap into to make this, uh, this connection between um, themselves, theater, and the founding era. Uh, and then, then also in that is where they do their research, is on that website. And that research is done through three different uh, avenues. You can research um, people, and we have about 45 people you can research on the founding era. And they're not all people that are in the show. I mean, they're, but they are important figures in the, uh, in the founding era that you can research. Second, you can research uh, key events of the founding era. So if you wanna, you wanna uh, research the Boston Massacre, you wanna research the Battle of Yorktown, you wanna research the Whiskey Rebellion, those are in, in events. And then lastly, you can research just by an iconic document, right, a key document from the period. So the Constitution, the Declaration, right, um, Common Sense. Those are, so you can do it through different avenues. Uh, and. Uh, and that's all built into that one-stop website. The idea being that the students, this is, and this is all curated by us, right? So the teacher doesn't have to worry about is this, the student getting the right research, are they getting the right materials, is there, you know, I mean, you know, the problem with the internet is the internet. Um, you tell a student to go research on the internet, you know, well, this way, that's contained for them, and so, they, it, so you can trust it. It also uh, breaks it down so that students don't get overwhelmed, right? Primary source documents are tough. I mean, that's, you know, that's complex reading, and so we've, we've, uh, we've taken very dense text and then excerpted it for students so that it's, so it's usable, right? I mean, Washington's farewell address is 33 pages long. You cannot drop a 33-page document uh, right in front of a student of any era, let alone the founding era. Um, so we've taken that and uh, excerpted that down to where it's uh, it's usable by students. So then, um, the, so that in the in-class uh, schoolwork. Um, so let me just go, just let me re review that just a little bit more of the steps that the students go through. So this is what they do. So the students they take this work, they'll choose. Um, they take the, they take the, the um, student workbook and it starts with a history of the founding era and who Hamilton was. Then it goes to um, teaching them how to analyze complex text. And so what we do is we use two pieces. Um, we use um, a piece that was written by the Reverend Samuel Seabury. Samuel Seabury wrote a piece criticizing uh, patriots uh, or people that want to break away from the king, right? He was a loyalist, and he was criticizing those people who want to break away. Hamilton wrote a refutation, saying, you know, well, here's why we should, you know, break away. Those two pieces, Lynn manuel Miranda used to write the song Farmer Refuted that's in the show. So what we do is we have the students, we teach them a process of analyzing that dense text. So they analyze the Seabury piece, What's Seabury's critical argument he's making? What is it Seabury's trying to tell us? Boom. Hamilton, what is his central argument? What is he trying to say? Boom. Take those two analyses you've now done, let's compare it to the lyrics of the song. The question being, did, even though Lin-Manuel Miranda changes the words in the song, they're not exactly the same words in the documents, does he maintain the integrity of the argument being made? That's the critical part, right? Is the argument being maintained? And then we let the student write about that. Because when, then the next thing the student has to do is you pick who it is you're, you want to um, study. You pick that person, you pick that event, you do that analysis, you do that research, and you use what you've learned to write your own performance piece just like Lynn manuel Miranda did. And that's what you saw those kids performing. So that's the process the students go through over the course of those days. That's what we're asking them to do. So then we get to the student performance and matinee. Every student that goes to the performance had to go through this process. Every student built a performance piece. Every student had to perform it uh, for their class, for their school. The schools then pick what they believe to be the best ones, they, the best one, they send that to us, we evaluate it, we pick 
12 to 14 or so, then those pieces end up on stage at the Richard Rogers Theater or wherever the show is traveling to, and those get performed live for their peers and the cast. Um, so that's, that's what the process they go through. This is what it looks like, the performance and study guide. Like I said, with interviews, with that's the, the compare and contrast that they're using for the, those pieces I was describing. The Saturday matinee, I mean, sorry, the student matinee. In the morning, you get the student performances. It's a full day program the students go to. They go to the performance, then there's a cast Q&A. So the cast is out on the stage. They have questions that the students have submitted from their schools that they want from the cast. The cast does a Q&A with the audience, and then in the afternoon they get to see Hamilton. For one Hamilton, each student pays 10 bucks, which if you know the price for Hamilton, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> um, this is a quote from Lynn. Our educational program, created with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Gilda Lehrman Institute, will bring 20,000 students to Hamilton each year over the life of the show. At these matinees before the show starts, they perform their own history-inspired works for their peers and our company. They are the most rollicking, spirited, inspiring audiences I've had the privilege to perform, in my, <coughs> perform for in my life. My only regret about leaving the role is the energy from those student matinees. They have changed my life. David Diggs was interviewed just a couple months ago and said almost exactly the same thing. The only thing he regrets about leaving the show were the student performances. Before, before our very first one, I remember talking to the stage manager at the theater who said the cast of Hamilton was the most nervous he'd seen them since opening night. And when I've traveled with the show to different cities and I've talked to the cast, the cast tells me they know that this audience of students is the most learned audience that they're going to perform in front of. And so, because uh, these kids know the history uh, behind, the, behind what the, the show is about. So right now, where are we at? Well, 153,424 teachers and students as of the show we did in Detroit uh, yesterday. No, tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Detroit? It's today. Today, we're in Detroit doing the show. <laughs> As of today, there are 153,424 teachers and students in the program in 22 cities. So this, the, once the show in, in New York was such a huge hit, um, everybody knew that we had a tiger by the tail. What are we going to do with it? Rockefeller said, well, we'll give you $6 million more million to take a national. Um, and so that got us going. And so then with fundraising efforts from uh, very much from Susan and her team that helped, that we pulled the, this $25 million together to do this in all of these cities, that's what's happened. 84 performances so far. The show is the sitting show in New York. We have student performances uh, for that. Uh, currently in Chicago, the sitting show in Chicago has student performances on a regular basis. And then as we tour the cities uh, as well. So it's a, it's, it's been, we've been in San Diego. Uh, we were here uh, last year, uh, and we were, we're coming back to Los Angeles um, this year as well. What about evaluation? Well, across 2, 000, about 2,000 surveys, teachers reported an increase in student enthusiasm and knowledge. So we went from 11% before to 35% had a lot of enthusiasm, and as far as knowledge goes, went from 3% to 16%. Across 42,000 surveys, students said they learned about the founding era and how it's connected to current events. This was something that was a huge thing for us. When the show was designed, I mean, the program was designed, it wasn't, the idea, there was not this built-in, oh, and we'll see how students connect to current events from this. That was not part of the design, it just happened. Students started seeing, wow, this is really like what, it's, like what things are going on now. I see myself in this. Or I see you know, our political situation in this. I see our, you know, whatever it was, whatever relationship. This, and they started making these connections that were totally organic, that was not pre-designed by us. Um, and you can see the increases, right? From uh, knowing a lot about the founding era went from 10% to 43% and thought the founding era connected to our current events from 14 to 39. Those are huge jumps in classrooms. Um, 
And also, another benefit of working with Title I students in the pro through the program was 20, almost 30,000 kids that had never had a professional theater experience. So what are they saying about it? I haven't learned history through song or other types of performances before. Previously, I learned history through textbooks and notes. Learning history through performances helps to make it more digestible. The T Act, now this, I love this one. The T Act could easily be compared to the net neutrality law now. They drank tea just as often as we use the internet, so a tax on that could be compared to then. Wow. <laughs> now there's a great connection. Um, and then here's a teacher. Using primary sources is always an area of focus in US history class, but I think that Edgeham helped to incorporate fun ways of presenting these sources and making them feel quote unquote alive. The students really enjoyed these presentations and I will be working to include these types of activities in the class curriculum going forward. This is the kind of thing we're talking about where we're transformational in classrooms, that students changing their practice because they see that student engagement and engagement then transfers to knowledge, right? Um, how are we funded? So we have a range of donors, individuals, traditional foundations, corporations, the state of Utah. The state legislature of Utah loves Hamilton. Um, and so when, ha when, when they heard that Hamilton was gonna be touring Salt Lake, the Utah state legislature passed a bill to raise funding to have students do this program. So, um, so the taxpayers of Utah funded the program for, for the state. Uh, that hasn't happened anywhere else. Uh, but I, that's a pretty innovative approach to, to, uh, to fund the program. Um, we get national and city-specific donations, so you may have a funder who you know, wants to support the program in whole as a national uh, effort, or you, you know, get people that are more concentrated on the city that they, you know, that they have uh, affinity for or where they're located. Um, it's about $90, $90 a student uh, for the program. Um, that's... that's um, uh, $60, uh, the ticket is actually 70, but 60 of it is uh, supported in a $10, like I said, a $10 student uh, contribution, and then uh, GLI puts in about $20 for program management. So that's how it breaks down as far as funding goes. All right, any questions on all of this stuff? Yes? How long Yes. So right now, it's just, it's uh, in the US. I, I voted for going to the UK just because I thought I could go to the UK, that'd be fun. Um, <laughs> I, I'm watching it next week, so. Oh, <laughs> are you? <laughs> well, <laughs> great. Yeah, no, right now it's, it's purely US based. Um, like I said, this program, uh, Edgeham, is ending uh, as far as touring the country at 2020. It'll still keep going in New York. Um, the program there will keep running. However, we, um, we are in very serious discussions uh, as far as a national program outside of um, the, the, the tour itself, but uh, allowing students to access the materials, the web, the resource providing materials. That's currently in uh, negotiations and we're working on that, but that is something that we would very, we very much want to do is provide, because, you know, I mean, if, you're, if you teach in, LA, let's say, and the show's here, but you don't teach at a Title I school, then you're not qualified, your school's not qualified to go. Or you teach in, you know, Fargo, North Dakota, right? It's not going to come anywhere close enough to you for your students to be able to attend. How do you then still access this program and everything it has to offer? That's a, that's a situation that we're trying to address. Yeah? So, um, I'm the principal of the Title I school and North East Arkansas. Yeah. And you're coming to Memphis. Are you doing this in Memphis for the touring show? I don't know. Are we doing, are we doing Memphis? Nashville, okay, yeah. So each of our shows, so for example, in St. Louis, we do in six states. Okay. Um, and, and it's up to the school. So if they want to travel and they can afford to travel, then they don't have to go to that route. And we just apply online? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if you, if you work for a school system or you know a school system, that um, you can just uh, go to our website and you can apply, and you can apply online there, yeah. Yeah. Have you been to Nashville? Yes, we have. Uh, as a matter of fact, last year, we pulled off a miracle in D.C. Um, the, the show was in D.C. Um, just, uh, just as the school year was starting. 
And so we actually, we usually give schools about six to eight weeks uh, with the curriculum to, for the teachers to get it into their curriculum. And, you know, DC, we, there were teachers who pulled this off in seven days. Um, and so what we did to support them was we sent our team down there and sat down and coached them through get, making it possible in that amount of time. And so they went from seeing it to students having uh, built performance pieces in seven days. So um, that was a little bit of an extraordinary circumstance, but yeah, we, 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 we did that one. Yeah. How many students? Oh, in a school, that varies. Um, so it depends on the size of the school. Um, it also depends on how they're structuring it. It also depends on the capacity we have for the show. So, you know, I mean, it, and the size of the theater. So you take a, a theater like the Richard Rogers, which is relatively small, um, you know, 13, 1400 uh, at the Richard Rogers, um, depends on how many schools we have involved, then we give them a capacity, right? So we'll say, okay, you can have 50 students or 70 students or whatever. You, you go to a city like St. Louis, St. Louis's theater is 4,000 seats. Right, which is why students said we reached way out because we had a huge theater, so we could invite a ton of schools um, from that you know wanted to come and wanted you know were willing to drive five hours um, to get there. So it rare, it really depends on the the venue and um, the number of schools that, that that apply and what their capacity is. You know, have very small schools or very large schools, so it varies totally. In this program, it's high school. Uh, in, in the US, most uh, US history is taught in 11th grade. Um, so it's generally 11th grade, some, maybe some 12th grade for AP programs or um, some places in 10th grade, but that's the age range. Um, the, the one we're looking at as far as a national program that's you know, more inclusive, um, we're looking more at middle school and high school, uh, be able to do both. Um, since they wouldn't actually be attending the show per se, um, so, you know, that eliminates some of our content concerns, maybe. Anything else? For the focus of yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any legislators for mayor? Do you need more attention to five? What would your call be? Yeah. So, really, everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so, like I said, we're, we're, um, we're at about 160,000 that have attended so far, but we're going to hit 250 by 2020. So we're really, this year, you know, that we're talking about about 90,000 more students um, by the end of 2020. Yeah. So if you're not a federal legislator, can you still get access to the materials? Not yet. <clears throat> yeah, that's why I said. That's what, that's what we're, we're working on right now. Um, and, and truly, if you're... <coughs> Excuse me. If you're at a school or you're part of a school system, um, sign up in as an affiliate school um, because that's a free program. Like I mentioned, we have 22, about 22,000 of them across the country. It's an absolutely free program. And then that way, you'll be uh, connected to us as far as like us letting us, you know, when, uh, you know, as things uh, roll out. I mean, you'll have access to all of our amazing materials for one thing, but the other thing is, as far as announcements, like um, when, you know, we launch this, you'll, you'll be on top of that. Yeah. Anything else from this stuff before we get to the fun part? This is the boring information stuff. No, I don't, I'm kidding, this is good stuff. But, but my, my, my favorite, you know, the thing that I miss the most about leaving the classroom is the teaching part. This is the fun part coming up. Um, but anything else, really, any other questions? Or if, if you have more questions, just let me know uh, if you, know, you think of something. Okay, so here's what I wanna do. Okay. So this is the research side I was talking about. So this is what the students see. Um, they go to this page, and you can see that there are the three different categories, right? People, events, and key documents. So the students then get to explore, right, and find uh, who do they connect to? What is it that they, you know, they find some kind of a, uh, a passion for? Which one of these, these, uh, these, these topics? So the three that we're gonna look at, and these are the actual documents that the students look at. So I'm giving you a, the, the actual thing here. So the first one we're gonna look at is Benjamin Banneker. I'm not gonna tell you anything about him because you'll, because just like the students, they learn from the documents of these people. Um, so our first is Benjamin Banneker. Our second is Angelica Schuyler Church, okay? 
And our next is the Marquet de Lafayette. I don't have his full name up there because it wouldn't fit <laughs> across the top. Um, so, uh, hello. So, um, Lafayette, we had Microsoft PowerPoint and created a problem, but I can tell you. So, Mar so Lafayette uh, and Banneker and Church. So those are the three that you're looking at. So what we're going to do is you're gonna choose one of those people, but you're also going to get together with other people in here. Unless you wanna be a lone wolf, and that's fine. But uh, if not, uh, get into a group of two or three of you. Make a new friend um, and, be and then decide who is it that you want to concentrate on. And then, if um, I can do this even without the slides. So go ahead and look in your, um, your packet for the one that's uh, not the biography stuff. It's the one that, that's the information one that you're going to fill out. That one. Yep. So it's this one right here. Research organizer. That's the one you're looking for. OK. This is what you're going to do with this. At the top, you're going to write down uh, the name of the person that you and uh, your partners have chosen that you're going to do your piece on. Below that, you'll see it says, background summary in two to four sentences identify the most significant, interesting, or memorable facts or aspects of the person uh, or events um, background story. Okay? So right here, this is where, so you're going to get a background that's part of your packet, right? So whichever person you choose has a background piece. Ah, there we go. So over here we have Elizabeth Schuyler. So what we found out about interesting about Elizabeth Schuyler was she was the second daughter of Revolutionary War General Philip Schuyler. She married Hamilton when she was 24. That's what you're going to do. You're going to pull out what did you find interesting in the background? What did you do find compelling about that story? Next, you get three primary sources that are provided for you. And this is exactly what the students have. You get three primary sources. You're going to take the first primary source and you're going to cite it. What is this? Right? Where did it come from and what is it? So for uh, Elizabeth, we have a letter from Alexander Hamilton to Elizabeth Hamilton, July 4, 1804, from the National Archives. Okay, that's the piece. Under that, you're going to read this and you're going to pull out a quote that you think gets to the essence of what is this piece about. So in this, um, the quote from this uh, letter is, I shall have terminated my earthly career. I shall cherish the sweet hope of meeting you in a better world. This was the letter that Alexander Hamilton wrote and left for his wife the night before the duel. Um, and so that's a pr pretty compelling line from that letter. And so you're going to do the same thing. Pull a line from it that really talks to you about who this person is. Then you're going to do that for the other two. So, so you have that for all three sources, right? All three sources, you've got uh, a quote or maybe two quotes that you pulled that you found compelling. Finally, we get to the bottom and it says the big finish. This is where you pull it all together. What story do you want to tell about this person based on their, from the background information and the quotes that you've now researched? What story do you want to tell? And then here, uh, so what aspect of the person or event speaks to you? How will your research help you tell the story? Then at that point, once you've pulled this together and you say, okay, here's the story I want to tell about Elizabeth, right? Here's what I want to say about her. Am I going to do that through, and here are your choices, a rap, a song, a cappella today, a poem, or a monologue? Or, well, and actually, we have kids who do uh, scenes, but that's up to you. If you want to sit down and write lines, that's OK. But um, so a rap, a song, a poem, a monologue, a spoken piece. Um, and it doesn't have to be monologue, right? You could have uh, two people that are just changing off lines. I mean, you know, be creative. Um, so, so that's our task. So um, we've got about um, 30 minutes. So we're going to take about 20 of that to do this process. So uh, find a friend, decide 
who do you guys want to uh, do your, uh, your, research, uh, your research on and uh, go through this process that the students go through? Best way to learn it is to do it, okay? And we're gonna lock the door. <laughs> okay, go ahead. And I'll walk around to see how things are going. Okay, who would like to perform <laughs> the big time? Here we are. Um, so uh, who's got a piece that would like to share with us? Okay, not everybody at once. <laughs> I know you guys have worked on something. I know you got something. Who else? You guys are working on your something. <clears throat> Um, what just uh, while you're, a couple of people are finishing their last lines. While you guys are uh, finishing up, one of the things about this program that we wanted to really emphasize with students, and it's the same, it's this, this tension between historical accuracy and historical integrity. And it was the same tension that um, Lynn Manuel and Ron Chernow ran into, what, uh, that they dealt with. Um, and Ron explained it to me. I thought, well, what he said, so in the musical, um, well, okay, in real life, Hercules Mulligan and John Lawrence and the Marquette de Lafayette never hung out in a bar in lower Manhattan with Alexander Hamilton. That never happened. <laughs> but it happens in the show. So is it historically accurate? No. However, is the way that the relationship of those men portrayed in the musical stick to the integrity of the relationship as far as we know of it, yes. So if you're gonna take and tell a man's life story in three hours, you're gonna to have to take some artistic license. But what's allowable and what isn't? And that's what we're having the students struggle with. That's what you're supposed to be look, struggling with. How do I take what this person was really about, yet tell it in a way that is artistic, yet still maintains the integrity of who this person was? Even though it may not maintain the accuracy, it maintains the integrity. And so that's the, that's, that's the critical thinking that we want the student to be doing as they go through this process. Okay, you wanna share what you got? Ah, yes you do, here. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so this is sort of a combination of a poem and a monologue. Um, we've picked, so do we describe no, the, the work we did, like, yeah, on the, like who it is, the whole, like all of it, no, just the just no. character. You summarize. Okay. So we went with Angelica Schuyler Church, um, and the documents we had were a letter from Angelica Church to Philip Schuyler, um, a letter from Angelica Church to Alexander Hamilton, her brother-in-law, and um, a letter from her to Thomas Jefferson. And um, for our bit, we focused on the first two, so her letters to uh, Philip Schuyler and Alexander Hamilton. And um, the piece that we wrote is sort of a, wound up being a combination, I think, of a poem and a monologue. Um, but the first piece that we had um, in our research was basically on the eve of his deathbed, or of his death, sorry, he was on his deathbed. And so our piece imagines that he's died the next morning. And in the letters, it comes across that she's quite a passionate, quite an emotional person, but she has this level of confidence in what she's saying. Um, and so this is, this is what we wrote. <clears throat> My throat is, throat is a bit not so good today, so. Why, why did you have to pick this cause to die for? It gave your life reason, but who will continue it now? Who will protect my dear sister who has to bear this affliction? Who will make this country what you wanted it to be? Now that you are no longer its custodian, which direction do we turn to, to be free? You had one shot, one shot. It was one shot that took you away from us. <laughs> Booyah. <laughs> um, we've, got, uh, we've got no time. Well, do you guys, I mean, short, you want to share what you've got? <laughs> that makes it easy.
You got, you got something drafted? Yeah, go, go. All right. This is completely. All right. Hi. Uh, we had Benjamin Banneker. Um, we researched, and we all said that because actually we didn't really know much about him. So um, hopefully this works out well for us. Um, I know I'll do a little more reading anyway. So I started it here. I said, I am Ben the Banneker, the free African from Baltimore. I have a mind that can calculate the stars. I have a passion to see my brethren free. Thomas Jefferson, can you follow me and deliver the freedom as you so wrote? We are all well endowed by our creator. Okay, so you guys get the idea. Um, so, thank you for coming. I hope this gave you some insight into this program and what we're trying to do. And uh, hopefully you stay in touch with us. Um, please uh, come to the website. Make sure that um, you encourage others uh, in education to uh, come take a look uh, and see what we have to offer. And um, we're um, more than happy to, uh, to accommodate uh, any questions that you may have. Or if you, uh, please, uh, you've got my, I believe you've got my card in there. If you have any questions, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.